Welcome everybody to today's webinar, which is called Chasing the Mosquitoes in the Urban South, Aedes aegypti, Water and Households. My name is Lenneke Knoop, I'm from the Water Channel, and this webinar is part of the webinar series IHC Delft Online Seminars for Alumni and Partners in cooperation with the Water Channel. So a very special welcome to all IHC alumni and partners. And before handing over to the speaker of today, I would like to mention a few things regarding logistics. So this is an interactive webinar and um, you can see in the bottom right corner a chat panel. And this chat panel can be used to ask questions to the speaker. We will compile them throughout the whole uh, presentation and afterwards we will post them one by one. Secondly, I would also like to ask you if you can write in this chat box your name, your expertise and your organization. So we have an idea of who is here in the webinar room. And the webinar and the presentation and references, etc. will all be shared also at the waterchannel.tv later on. So our speaker today is Dr. Tatiana Acevedo. She is a geographer with a background in political studies and she holds the position at IHC Delft of lecturer and researcher in politics of sanitation and wastewater governance. Currently, she carries out research to the mosquito called Aedes aegypti in urban areas in Mozambique and in Colombia. And this mosquito is the one that can transfer diseases like dengue, zika and chikungunya, which we read about in the news frequently. Now in this webinar, Tatiana will explain how mosquitoes transfer these diseases and also what prevention measures can be taken. She will show the approach of the research, which is a bit different than the conventional research. She shows the comparative cases focusing on households. And she will explain how water supply availability, politics, community strategies to store water and much more all have impact on the presence of this mosquito. Now with this, I would like to show you just a one minute clip of this most dangerous animal in the air for you to get an idea of what is actually what we're going to discuss about. And after that, I'd be very happy to hand over to Tatjana. Good morning. Uh, so my name is Tatiana Cerdeo Guerrero. I work here at IHC Delft and I'm going to be talking today about uh, water and households and mosquitoes and, and about how we can learn more than about the mosquito, about the relationship between communities and mosquitoes in the urban south. Uh, So in 2014 and 2015, various outbreaks of dengue have, uh, were reported in Mozambique. Uh, in countries of Latin America and the Caribbean, such as Colombia, there have also been outbreaks of dengue, Zika, and Chikungunya. Now, high percentages of Aedes aegypti, the mosquito that most effectively transmits these diseases, were found in cities such as Pemba in the north of Mozambique, Maputo, its capital in the south, Barranquilla, a Caribbean uh, city in Colombia, and Buenaventura in the south uh, uh, east west of the city. Now, dengue, Zika, and chikungunya and their transmission vector, Mosquito Aedes aegypti, are tied to water as this mosquito lays eggs in stored water in or around households. It's important to mention that after they breed, these mosquitoes do not always parade through the city like other mosquitoes, like for example Anopheles, the one that transmits malaria, but they hide inside households behind doors and corners. So this is a daytime uh, feeder uh, mosquito. Now, it is important to mention that besides being tied to water, uh, Aedes aegypti are also tied to climate change. Why? Because the studies have warned of the possibility that climate change might increase the likelihood uh, of diseases spread by insects in new areas as temperature can affect the distribution of the mosquito and the effectiveness of the virus transmission and also rainfall can increase surface water, which will provide uh, breeding sites for more and more mosquitoes. Now, the pattern of dengue spread uh, has changed through the years as the mosquito, as the Aedes aegypti, 
has adapted to new processes of economic, political, and social change. Now, one of the main characteristics of Ayres Aegypti is that it stays close to humans. Uh, like the flying pattern of Ayres Aegypti is not very, like it cannot be very long. So they need to stay close to humans. And uh, so they have adapted their biting periods to those of human activities. Now female mosquitoes can develop and lay eggs in aquatic habitats, easily found in cities. So as the world has been urbanizing, the mosquito has been urbanizing too. Stagnant or stored water, buckets, tanks, drums, cisterns, flower vases, pools, tires, and other human-made containers provide the needed cultivation habitat where larvae will develop shortly into adult versions of the mosquito. Now, this project uh, that I have been thinking about in uh, recent years uses an ethnographic approach to study households, water supply availability, intermittence, the fact that water comes and goes without like a pattern many times, and distribution, and document politics and everyday communities strategies to obtain and store water which focuses on the interdependence between intermittent water supply, that is water that can, like that will be available throughout some hours of the day, but then uh, will be cut, the fish and solid waste collection, and the Aedes aegypti. It also takes into account the different legacies left by civil wars and rural crises on processes of unequal urbanization. In doing so, uh, what I have wanted to do is to engage with multiple actors, local and national regulators and state officials, water services providers, non-governmental organizations, and of course the different communities in the city's neighborhoods. Uh, now, it is important to mention, because I received some emails of the participants in the webinar today, that my focus is not like on on the mosquito per se, like on the characteristics of, like the biological characteristics of the mosquito. And it is not uh, on like epidemiological and statistical factors or models uh, surveying like the flights of the mosquito and biting periods, uh, like uh, in incidence of dengue or, or, or the disease itself. Like this research is more concerned on the relationship on this dance between communities and mosquitoes, because mosquitoes are there and have been there for many years. So it's these choreographies of, of, of biting, of, of flying, and of people being used to this, uh, and of people, of, of who is getting sick and why. How is this disease affecting cities? Uh, is it affecting everyone the same way? And why? Which are the historical factors that will explain that? Now, since there is no vaccine for dengue, uh, no available vaccine, the only way to reduce transmission has been to control mosquitoes' breeding sites. So this research will ensure that the realities of dengue uh, in cities are taken into account in national policies. So the aim is to pr produce a specific knowledge on the connection between water supply and dengue, uh, between sanitation and dengue, between the drainage and dengue and also analyze the distinct reasons for water storage practices. If there's water that is being stored in the city, to ask ourselves why. Mm, and why is it being stored in or around living areas? To do what? To inform and document policies and practices, not only in what concerns the government treatment of dengue outbreaks or chikungunya outbreaks, or Zika outbreaks, but also regarding water reforms and water supply providers to tell to, uh, providers and also regulators, hey, dengue and Zika and chikungunya, it is a problem of water. It is a problem of intermittent water supply. Hmm? In this way, the project will contribute, or it, it, it aims to contribute in coordination with local and international partners to the development of new strategies to fight dengue which will potentially contribute to the development of new models for water management, uh, especially of, of the distribution of, of, of water and sanitation services in the city. Mm -hmm. Now again, 
There are, of course, uh, development outcomes. If you're going to study dengue, some scholars say you need not just not just to study it, but also to be able to be like pragmatic and and and, and talk about what can work or what cannot work, what is perhaps fair to these communities, uh, what they will be more prone to to accept or to or to follow. So, firstly, uh, we will try to like communicate our findings with people that uh, that that design policies to fight dengue in cities, uh, so that it can be more tailored to the context. All gathered information will contribute to changing public health approaches, perhaps, to dengue. Uh, so, like a basic uh, measure that is taken in many cities, which is, for example, giving out nets that people will sleep with these nets uh, throughout the night. It's just, for example, which is the particularity of dengue is that it bites in the morning, so perhaps the net won't be such a good uh, measure. Secondly, inhabitants will receive improved public health regardless of their gender, age, and socioeconomic class. So it's also this idea to work in the communities to, to learn uh, what is going on there before intervening. Um, and uh, finally, make this bridge be between uh, public health and, and the realities of dengue and water service providers, because it's not a clear link that we do these days. Usually they do not, uh, like they are not invited to the discussion on, on, on these epidemics, although they have a lot to do with it. So I would like uh, to make this also more interesting and, 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 and fun, I hope, uh, to talk about the study cases and, and of the examples of what we are trying to do, because that will make uh, like all the text that I have just read way more um, interesting and, and, and uh, yeah, like useful. So the Barranquilla case. Um, I would like to start with an anecdote. Uh, I was invited uh, when I first arrived to do field work in Barranquilla uh, to a barbecue in one of the like uh, gated communities in the city's uh, northern neighborhoods, which are mainly inhabited by this one at least was mainly inhabited by uh, upper middle class young couples, and as many gated communities in the urban uh, sunny regions of Colombia, this had apartment buildings, but also it had something that some people called uh, the pool area or the spa area, which uh, has like usually a pool, a sauna, a jacuzzi, and of course these areas always have uh, like a set of showers and of toilets uh, for people to change and, and, and shower before and after swimming in the pool. So the barbecue was... Um, was in this area, and everyone was talking, uh, but suddenly the conversation went silent as two Afro-Colombian women who were working as domestic workers, because they had a uniform of domestic workers, in one of the buildings, they crossed the pool, heading towards the showers area. And um, there was uh, some anxiety among the group of uh, barbecue goers, uh, because they thought that, that perhaps the domestic workers were um, using the sauna or the jacuzzi. Uh, like there was this out of place uh, like uh, anxiety until one of the women that was attending the barbecue, she explained that what was going on is that domestic workers would make use of, uh, of the showers in the spa area to shower before going home after like working. They, they Usually their work uh, day goes from 6 in the morning or 7 in the morning until 6 or 7 in the afternoon. So before going home, uh, they would shower because they explained there was certain intermittence in, in water services in the areas where these domestic workers worked. So they took advantage of the showers to, to shower. Um, they, they they discussed that they would uh, like talk about this in a former in a formal meeting of uh, homeowners of the building, and that they will try to forbid maids from entering uh, the, the showers, the 
the spa area. Now, this anecdote is very telling both of uh, the inequality uh, situation in Barranquilla, which is the most the biggest city of the Colombian Caribbean. Uh, so the class inequality is also like uh, historical racial inequalities, but it also talks about the situation uh, that was being experienced in the city in what concerned the distribution of water, of good water services. Now, throughout uh, my field work in Barranquilla, what I could witness was were a lot of discussions about water, about the very high tariffs of water, uh, about the frequent and expected cuts in water services, but also uh, People were discussing. Um, oh, people were discussing other issues that had to do with water, such as um, rain. So there were problems with drainage. Uh, every time it rained in the period from uh, the rainy period, which goes from June to December, there were they would uh, witness frequent flash flooding, and this had to do also with the problem with solid waste management. But they were also discussing the fact that this flash flooding would affect uh, electricity infrastructure, which would already be not well maintained, and this will cause power outbreaks. So they were discussing water, the water service, which was not very good quality, but also expensive. They were discussing flash flooding, they called this arroyos, which was affecting, yeah, like uh, normal life, routines, and traffic. But they were also discussing power cuts. Now, every time there were power cuts, electricity cuts, due to flash flooding, uh, communities would also sometimes witness water cuts. Because Barranquilla is a very sloppy city with uh, a topography that uh, like that will require pumping stations to pump water. So if there's no electricity in some of these pumping stations, they would also experience uh, power outages. So I began this quest on, on, on Barranquilla and its water distributions by focusing on history. So I, I, I first analyzed the World Bank project that was made in 1985 and that failed. And I wanted, it was a World Bank project that aimed to improve water drainage and sanitation uh, infrastructure, especially in lower income neighborhoods in Barranquilla. It failed not only because of political party, uh, like uh, corruption and different ideas of the city they wanted. Do they want to include the lower income areas or do they want them to go to other cities? Uh, but also because of things that were not but that couldn't be foreseen. So, for example, there was, uh, due to the Colombian civil uh, conflict, uh, armed conflict, there were big, uh, like, um, rural urban migrations throughout the start of the, of, of the 1990s and the early 2000s. Uh, so, for those of you that perhaps do not know, the Colombian armed conflict lasted and, and uh, for uh, two decades, and it involved uh, left-wing guerrillas, uh, armies, and also paramilitary armies. And especially these paramilitary armies had the technique uh, of doing massacres in, in, in rural communities. And, and, and throughout uh, the war, um, Barranquilla received a lot of, of, of displaced communities, rural communities that were displaced in the midst of the war and that had to like escape from their rural uh, lands or, or, or the places where they lived and go to Barranquilla with not much uh, to start all over. So if you take a look at this uh, graphic, for example, uh, in the year um, 2000, for example, Barranquilla received 16,612 uh, people. Uh, and these and this displaced communities mainly went to the south of the city, to the low-income areas of the city. Now, I have here also the Gini coefficient. Now, the Gini coefficient is a measure of a statistical dis, uh, dispersion, and it represents income and wealth distribution. So if you have one that is 
absolute inequality, like wealth is concentrated in one person. And if you have zero, that means that there's a horizontal distribution of income. So you can see that it is around the year 2000 where um, when the Gini coefficient starts being 0, 0,5, which is like higher, uh, like the inequality becomes higher between people in Barranquilla that are wealthy and, 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 and communities that have uh, very, very low incomes, that are experiencing poverty, that are experiencing the lack of formal jobs, and lacks, like, yeah, of course, lack of, of infrastructure, of housing, of education, of health. Uh, not only the war uh, caused migrations, rural rural migrations, but also like we had droughts and flooding uh, in rural areas that were where infrastructure was already um, in many cases shattered by, by by the war and by lack of investment. So what I started seeing a lot in Barranquilla throughout my field work was that a lot of water cuts in the south, which was this area with especially the southwest, which was a low income area that was experiencing the arrival, the massive arrival of these of these new communities, they were experiencing water cuts uh, that were unexpected. And these water cuts may, many times were caused uh, because of power outages, because there were power outages in the pumping stations. Hmm? So what I started seeing was like a lot of practices of water storage, uh, just in case water would uh, start, uh, and yeah, just in case water would be cut. And what I also uh, witnessed was that a lot of people started getting sick. So there had been dengue for a while in, in Barranquilla and, and in Colombia in general. But throughout, for example, 2014, a lot of people were becoming sick of chikungunya, which was a, a disease that was transmitted by the same mosquito but that was uh, like a little bit different and, and the name was funny, there were songs about it. People would uh, like only try to, to deal with it with acetaminophen, with like painkillers, ibuprofen and life would go on. And I started realizing also that uh, it was mainly women in this sector that, uh, that stayed home and, and, and had to lose one day of work because uh, because of this chikungunya uh, disease. And by 2015, things got a little bit more complicated because then there was a new disease emerging in the southwest of Barranquilla, which was Zika. Now, uh, the spread of Zika in Colombia was really, really uh, fast. So in 2015, there were 341 cases of Zika. And in less than a year, the cases were 99,721. So, so the disease, Zika uh, causes discomfort, fever, rashes, and conjunctivitis. Uh, but it has a peculiarity, uh, and it is that it can be transmitted prenatally. There were lots of uh, like of worries because of the case of uh, some uh, mothers that transmitted the the virus uh, prenatally in in in, in in Rio, in, in Brazil. So the state started being more and more worried, and there were more campaigns uh, to deal with the disease. Now, it is important to mention that also, according to Colombian statistics, women are were more vulnerable uh, to the disease because for every two thirds uh, of, because two thirds of reported cases of Zika in Colombia were diagnosed in women. Now, some scholars have pointed out the fact that women are the ones that in Colombia sometimes stay home in the morning to cook or to take care of the water storage uh, and that that can be caused, that that can make them more vulnerable to the biting of the mosquito because as we discussed at the beginning this mosquito bites in the morning uh, it is a daytime feeder uh, what I want to point out here and with this quote is that Many of the measures to to stop uh, dengue, uh, Zika, and chikungunya were uh, targeting communities and, and telling them, "Hey, you cannot store more water, and if so, you need to cover the tanks of the liquid, change the water." Uh, so there was a, a policing of of communities 
by telling them you need to stop storing water. And many times these communities, which were already doing two or three jobs in, in the informal market, uh, did, would not stop storing water because it was necessary due to the unexpected costs, and also did not have perhaps time. And, and when being like blamed for the spread of the disease, the answer they had was sometimes to not let the health brigades come in, or to think that they will still continue doing the same things they were doing because they didn't have time to, to change their water storage practices and, and, and invest in, in, in closed tanks. Uh, also, another measure of the government was to ask women to avoid pregnancy, to delay pregnancy throughout a, a, a period of time, which was also lived with a lot of anxiety in the community because it implied first that women can't decide alone over when to get pregnant and secondly that women have access to, to contraceptive measures and it put a lot of the blame in the women because if the government is asking you not do not store water and do not get pregnant and you have to continue storing water and you do get pregnant perhaps then it is a double blame because we told you so. Mm. Now, this was the original seed of, 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 of this uh, inquiry of, of thinking, how is uh, this disease lived in the neighborhoods, in the barrios, uh, and who is being affected by it, and who is being blamed of, of it, and how it is, uh, this disease crystallizes only in some conditions of inequality, in some conditions of, of, of intermittent water supply. Uh, so with that, uh, with that inquiry, with that doubt, um, I, I thought that perhaps we should do comparative work between cities that have had to struggle with the same problems, with the same mosquitoes, and to see what the cities had in common and also what the cities could talk to, like how they could discuss and have a dialogue to see if their experiences could help the others. So uh, with this in mind, we started a project, and this was thankfully not me alone, but this is a project with a lot of uh, amazing uh, women. Uh, so Professor Sandra Manuel in, uh, in Mozambique. We, uh, and, a, and a big team of, 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 of interdisciplinary researchers, we started trying to understand uh, the way dengue crystallized in, in two cities of, of Mozambique. Now, the first city we studied, which is the city where um, also the outbreak was stronger, was Pemba. Now, it's important to say that dengue had been inactive in Mozambique for 30 years. Now there are new uh, outbreaks, there were new outbreaks, and there were also little outbreaks of chikungunya. So what, what was explained in this? So the first uh, thing that I want to say in the Mozambique case, which is a, a research that is not over, <coughs> it's on its way, is that at the beginning when we arrived and having the experience that we had in Colombia, we thought that perhaps we were going to find the same pattern of women being more prone to getting sick. But we, what we found is that women, uh, like women were not the ones staying home in, in the context of Pemba, of low-income uh, neighborhoods in Pemba. What we found was that there were lots of young men uh, staying home, watching TV, or playing with their smartphones, because these young men had no formal jobs, and they have uh, cash-paying jobs uh, during the tourist season, uh, or not a scholarized young men. Uh, they will hang out in their homes and, and wait for the tourists season to, to, to work, and elderly women uh, we found uh, in the homes. So what we found perhaps is that here the pattern of transmission was a little bit different. Uh, young and adult women were out working, and, and we found mostly like young men. Pemba also, it's important to say, it's a city that depends on tourism and on mining. So throughout the years, it has received uh, lots of also rural to urban migrations. Another thing that we found that it's important is that taking into account that the feedback, the, the, the enterprise of, of water, like there are water cuts that are very uh, like uh, 
daily water cuts, daily water like uh, ra ra rationing in, in these low income neighborhoods. So they built uh, cement tanks that go like that are done in different shapes and in different sizes. Now families in low income areas that will have more funds will build these like rectangular tanks where they will be able to store more water and they will later become suppliers selling water where shortages are really bad. And they will sometimes treat this water with chlorine. Um, but yeah, families with lower incomes will have smaller tanks or will just store water like around their houses in different places. Another very important thing, sometimes we think, oh, why do families have tires, car tires, truck tires, and, and there's this big uh, fight with the community to tell them to throw them away. Firstly, and I have seen also that in Barranquilla, sometimes solid waste management is a problem, so communities won't know what to do with their solid waste. And secondly, in the case of Pemba, we found that they use uh, these, ma these are tires, so they will, uh, the inner part of the tire is removed and uh, it's put into strips, and these strips are used in construction because they put them with bamboo, and with that, they lift the walls that are often coated with cement or clay. That is because uh, other materials such as concrete or stones or adobe are more expensive. And these communities are also migrating from the rural areas to the urban areas in search for job opportunities due to the mining boom or the tourism boom. So after they do that, they remove the inner part. These tires are left in the patios so that kids can play with them and sometimes they are used also to lock doors so that like thieves won't be able to come in in the night because they will make noise. And these tires of course are the Hilton Hotel for mosquitoes for Aedes aegypti because Aedes aegypti also we have found throughout the work of, of, of some of the researchers, they like water at some temperature, they need the water to be uh, at some temperature so if the water is being a little bit warmer, then you will get more and more mosquitoes. Another researcher did her work in Maputo, and what she found is that there was a, like a difference in the way that storage happened, because while families that had more funds, everyone experiences intermittency, but while some people experience intermittency and can invest in big tanks that are located in the, in the roofs, uh, so they will be First, these tanks will be closed, will be far, so they will be less prone to, to, to getting, uh, yeah, to having contact with the mosquito. Some other families will have less resources to invest, to make the first investment in these big tanks, and will end up storing water in, uh, like in different uh, uh, smaller containers, and these containers uh, will be stored inside or outside, and these containers will be more prone uh, to, to harvesting mosquitoes so, or to being a possible habitat of the mosquito. One of the things that the, it's out there but we haven't been able to, to fully explore because as I said this is a project that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ongoing is the, the relationship between drainage and solid waste. So solid waste is an also a, a condition of possibility. If there weren't solid waste problems it would be harder for this mosquito to thrive as, as she does in, in, in low income areas uh, where any container acts as a, co as a habitat for them. But this is a thing that we have not yet tackled also, which are the, the habits of the communities in regards to solid waste. Um, another thing, and with this I want to close, and, and this is the aim of the project in the long run, is also to see which are the the, the similarities between Colombia and Mozambique in terms of, uh, so Mozambique also went through a civil war from 77 to 92. It was also a big uh, deadly war that were, had like, I think about one million victims between the war and the famines that war caused. And the, there was a destruction of much of the rural infrastructure, so hospitals, rail lines, roads, schools that child soldier phenomena, which is also uh, what we had in Colombia, landmine. So that after the, the, like the targeting of rural populations has been systematic in both Colombia and Mozambique, this, this 
and there's there are paths of migration uh, from the rural areas that are devastated from the war to cities and and so we have two things that we see in common which is one rural poverty uh, and two uh, big inequality because throughout the war in both Colombia and Mozambique not only people became impoverished but also there were some people that became uh, like that, that that became wealthy so we see big uh, Gini coefficients in both countries big deep inequalities not only between the rural and the urban but within the urban areas mm -hmm. and I think uh, and, and we have been uh, discussing how these inequalities are are a condition for the mosquito to thrive. The fact that there is water, but this water is being uh, distributed only in some areas, that there is good water, but only for some, and that, there, that there's density, but the density is not the sole condition of possibility. It's a density where there's some people that are very poor and some people that are wealthy enough uh, or very wealthy. So. Um, with this, uh, I, we have also been doing archival work to understand a little bit the history of Mozambique. And, and, and with this, I, I would like to end. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to remind you that this Mozambique part of, of the research has been a um, group uh, endeavor uh, and that I have my colleague Sandra Manuel in the University, Eduardo Montliani, Margarida Paulo, and uh, I like the team of students, Angela Bayona, uh, and uh, two amazing Mozambican anthropologists uh, that have been doing the work mostly in Pemba, uh, Tanisia, and uh, Amanda. Uh, so now I would like to open the floor for questions and comments and uh, ideas. Thank you very much, Tatiana, for your presentation and for all the insights in this very necessary topic. That's something that I uh, would definitely conclude. And um, we have a few questions, and some of them are a bit related to each other. So I would like to ask you the first question that I have put up um, here on the left side. So the first question is from somebody from India. And he asks, in India, there were no dengue outbreaks before 2006. And in 2006, it suddenly appeared. And since then, it is the biggest public health issue every year. Um, so do you know what might have been the reason for the sudden appearance? Um, or could you, from your knowledge? Thank you. Um, thank you for the participant from India. Um, I think it's something that also we witnessed in Mozambique. So in Mozambique, the, the virus, the epidemic was, there weren't any epidemics registered in 30 years. And all of a sudden, in 2014, there was an epidemic. So we work also closely with um, Dr. Paula Vilo from, uh, from the INS, from the Institute of National Health of Mozambique. And she told us that when she first went to Pemba from Maputo, she took two sets of clothes because she thought it was going to be easy. Like she was going to go there and see another epidemic of malaria and then go back home. She's the head of the epidemiology lab. But when she stayed, when she arrived there, she ended up staying, I think, for two months because she realized this is not a malaria epidemic. This is dengue. And for her, it was a big surprise and for communities too. Uh, I think the, the causes that interest me the most are the social causes that, that can, of course, the mosquito evolves with the communities. Uh, so the mosquito adapts to new social and economic uh, challenges that perhaps can favor the breeding, their breeding. So there are some scholars that say that with urbanization, perhaps we will see more cases of, uh, of Aedes aegypti instead of other mosquitoes, such as the malaria mosquito, because this is a mosquito that thrives in urbanization or, or in unequal urbanization. The fact that there are some people storing water, uh, there are some people that are experiencing uh, solid waste management problems. But I think, and this is also the case of Sao Paulo, 
if the conditions that brought the mosquito are there and unchanged, if the social and economic conditions are there, the epidemic can come back. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Sao Paulo, uh, Human Rights Watch have said, yeah, a lot of things were done from the point of view of epidemiology, but if you look at the social conditions of Rio de Janeiro and, and of the big inequalities there, um, it can happen again because everything is the same. The same people that were poor before are poor today. The same people that were experiencing problems with water are experiencing water problems today. Uh, so I think I will point to that. But of course, I don't know the Indian case. No, well, thank you very much for the answer. I think that also answers um, one of the other questions. Well, there is uh, Joshua Orea asked, like, uh, he had a dengue outbreak in Mombasa and Dar es Salaam in 2017. And he wants to know, so, okay, you just explained about the social factors, but could, is it in this case, do you know if it could have been due to the flash floods? Or how long is the breeding period of this mosquito species, he specifically asks? It, I... In the, in the case of Barranquilla and in the case of Moma, of uh, Pemba and, and Maputo, there are flash flooding events. And, and I think what is interesting here is that flash flooding is married to solid waste management problems. If they were not, like, usually cities will have drainage uh, channels, historical ones or natural ones that just form. But what is blocking them, or even they will have very good uh, drainage systems. In Barranquilla, now they are building, they are investing huge amounts of money. But if these drainage channels are being blocked because of a solid waste management problem, that there's your flash flood. Hmm? And I think, uh, also I think that it, we don't see here in the Netherlands, but we see a lot in the south and everywhere, is that cities have, uh, cities are not plain. They have... Uh, like a, a topography that is sloppy, so that also will will entail and and rapid unequal urbanization. There's your flash flood, and of course, any uh, pool of water will be a possible habitat for the mosquito. So yes, flash flooding is really interlinked with uh, with this mosquito, and that is why also we see that uh, rainy seasons in all the three countries. Uh, are the ones where the mosquito will will thrive the most. Okay, then I think you have answered this question. I just want to pose it to um, show that there are other places where these examples exist. So somebody from Italy um, mentioned, he was referring back to his own childhood, saying that I'm told that mosquitoes and dengue incidents were reported in Italy when I was a kid, and maybe even before, but now it's hardly there. So I think, um, well, you answered that uh, already uh, because it's mainly because of the social uh, structures. So Yeah, like I think sometimes I, I got, it was really funny when during, during the epidemic they will tell people don't go to the Caribbean because there's Zika, don't go to the Caribbean because there's uh, chikungunya. Especially Zika had everyone very scared. And of course you can be very unlucky and if you go to a resort perhaps uh, you can yeah, like perhaps be very unlucky and get beaten. But I, I really doubt it because like uh, I was in Puerto Rico during a chikungunya outbreak and like things in the Hilton Hotel were perfect. You know, they have pools and clean towels, which means they are washing thousands of towels every day. Uh, so all the industry, the hotel industry in the Caribbean is based on water, on the conspicuous consumption of water for some. But of course, then at the same time, you had some neighborhoods, and this was before the hurricane, that had absolutely no water. They had been uh, without water for weeks, and they were harvesting rainwater. And these neighborhoods were full with people that were sick of chikungunya. And it's a very unreported thing, because chikungunya is not as, uh, it's not deadly or anything. So... Uh, yeah, like it's a very, it's very much related to class and, and, and to the way water is distributed in the city. So yeah, perhaps if you go to the Caribbean, you won't be in the barrios or in the neighborhoods where, where the mosquitoes are, are having a, a big fest. So yeah, like here in Amsterdam, because of the canals, 
there are mosquitoes during the summer with uh, the raising temperatures uh, that we are witnessing. Uh, perhaps there will be more, more mosquitoes. But for an epidemic to, to thrive, I think there have to be other, uh, like more social and, and, and like complications that, that will have some people struggling with, with water and, and with waste. Yeah. Yeah, so you, um, we received another question related to this by email. So this person has not joined the webinar and may, I'm not sure if she would ask the same, but maybe we can put it a bit more strong because she asked, okay, so are mosquitoes related diseases class sensitive? What about Zika? So you keep referring that, it, that that's the case. Would you also, um, would that be one of your statements or would you still be a bit hesitant or would you like to add something to that? Or is this for you a conclusion? Uh, I think um, like mosquitoes per se are not class sensitive. I, I don't want to like put the mosquitoes, like there is no like mosquitoes and people. There is a relationship there. Uh, and this relationship has to do with socioeconomical factors. Now, if you take, if you Google Rio Zika epidemic uh, babies. The pictures you're going to see, and I don't need to put them because they are everywhere on the internet, uh, are of a certain type of women. And sometimes you will see a little bit her house, and sometimes you will see a little bit her patio, and sometimes you will even see the stored water behind her. Mm. So yeah, like I can say that Zika in Rio de Janeiro affected a certain type of women, affected a certain type of family, uh, and uh, made vulnerable people more vulnerable. So that tells us a lot about not only class, huh? Because like in the case of Barranquilla, and that's why I started with the with the with the fragment of of of, of these Afro-Colombian domestic workers. We're also talking about the history of a country, so in the case of the Caribbean or, or in the case of Rio de Janeiro, uh, we're talking about race, no? Race as a social construction, as a historical construction that will make Afro-Colombian people more prone to, to let's say, lower incomes, like real segregation, that okay. make them live in these neighborhoods, have this in, or, or that is interrelated to it. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tatiana. I have um, two other questions. One is from, uh, from Abram. He asks, what are the limitations of using Gambusia to limit mosquito larvae in locked water bodies? Now, I have been told that that's also called the uh, mosquito fish. So is this something that you can uh, elaborate upon? Is this used a lot, or is it not most effective? or like whenever you go to southern cities where there are uh, epidemics of dengue or, or in the case of Colombia, chikungunya and Zika, scientists uh, and public health officers will tell you, oh, we have all these new technologies, all these new ideas, and I, I applaud that and I like the creativity like that I see in Colombia and the amount of work that they have done. Uh, it's amazing, like uh, genetic modification of the mosquitoes, so they will be sterile, uh, like uh, exercises of uh, hydroinformatics, uh, like so, and, and, and then fishes and, and, and a lot of interventions that are there. And I think uh, they are very cool and very interesting and amazing. The limitations I see there is that yeah, like uh, that, that it's going to be funded everywhere, that it's going to be, like I, I think I have some apprehensions. For example, the fact that people will be told, oh, use this fish or use this product. And if they don't use it, then it will be their fault that the epidemic is being spread. Um, or that uh, the state will invest lots and lots of uh, research funds in this, like, very uh, interesting research, which is necessary, but at the same time, lose, lose sight of something. Hey, this is related to trash. 
can we deal with that? There's a big landfill. People are living there. Uh, so can we discuss this, please? Hmm? So <coughs> sometimes when we talk about, yeah, like uh, green infrastructure or, or, or new things that are going on that are very hip and fashionable, uh, it's great that they're happening, but at the same time, let's not forget to talk about the basic things. Like, let's talk about housing. Let's talk about water supply. Let's talk about why uh, utilities will uh, get, uh, like, they will get out, how do you say that? They will still be rationing some neighborhoods, and they will uh, still have, uh, like, uh, a good uh, reputation, uh, that this is normalized, that it's normalized that some communities will not have access to solid waste management. Why? So I think I love every single new technology and idea, and uh, but let's not lose sight of a basic discussion on, on housing, on social housing, uh, on reparations due to the war, uh, on, on things like that. Yeah. that are related to the mosquito. Yeah, very clear. <laughs> Thank you. I have one last question that is um, may, yeah, maybe a bit difficult to answer. So the uh, question is raised by Flavia. So are there any actions of measures taken between health security and mosquitoes to decrease the impacts of mosquitoes in rural and urban areas? If yes, what kind of actions, measures? Now, of course, you just mentioned uh, a lot and that it's a whole range and it's all interrelated. Is there maybe one uh, thing that you would like to address being the last question of this webinar, or so one final message that you would like to give uh, uh, the people in the room here? Well, thank you very much for the question. I think uh, the one that is, even if there's all this new technology and things going on, uh, the basic measure is health brigades. Health brigades will usually tell people to stop storing water or to close, to put leads. Uh, this is a measure that has been, like sometimes people would tell you, but people are stupid. Why do not they just cover their water? This is a measure that has been in place for like decades and decades and decades. Uh, so if people do not do that, it's because it's unpractical, because leads get... Uh, like there's no maintenance of all these things. So in the case of Mozambique, we saw, for example, in Pemba, lots of uh, wood or sink placed on the on the water tanks, uh, or people trying to treat their water with uh, chlorine, with uh, they call it certeza, which in certainty in in English. Um, that is like the main uh, thing that health brigades will do, and they will also try to tell people not to store tires, not to store checher, as it's called in Spanish, like things that people would store just in case, pieces of uh, bricks and things that can, uh, like, harvest water. Um, this is the main, the main measure that I have seen taken across countries. Yeah, like, uh, and of course, like, hospitals, prevention campaigns, they will tell people, uh, things that how to treat or take care of the water. Um, these are the actions and measures that I have seen mostly. Yes. Okay, with that, thank you very much, Tatjana, for your presentation and thank you all the participants for all the input and the questions. Thank you IAG and Maria and Wim who are in the back uh, organizing the uh, technical facilities also. So I would like to mention that the recording will be there, shared on the watch channel, but also on the YouTube channel of IHG Delft. And with that, I would uh, wish like to wish everybody a very good day. Before yes. finishing it, we have a website, and also there you can see all of the members of the of the team, the, the amazing researchers that that are working on it. It's it's chasingthemosquito.com. I will put it up here in the chat box. Sorry. This is, it's there. No, very good that you say that. Mm -hmm. And it's also in the references on the page where we uh, put your presentation. So thank you very much, Tatjana. And, um, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Leneke. Bye. And everyone. Thank you. Gracias. Obrigada.